You're listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast with service members from across the military sharing their stories of combat and survival. And now, here's your host, Mark Zeno. Welcome in once again to the Hazard Ground Podcast. As always, we appreciate you joining us each and every week before we get to this week's story about a former Marine captain and his tales in Vietnam. Just a couple of reminders about our social media sites. Follow them uh, everywhere we are, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast. And if you're watching this podcast, make sure that you guys are subscribing to our YouTube channel. Also, subscribe to Kill Cliff's YouTube channel because you can catch everything there. Download the Kill Cliff app. You can see us there as well. Make sure you guys leave the reviews on Apple Podcasts. They're starting to grow. We're starting to get more of them, but we need even more. We are moving up the scales of the top Apple Podcasts. We can't do it without your help. It doesn't have to be a very long review. Just a couple of quick words on why you like the podcast. Give us a five-star rating, and we certainly appreciate you guys doing that. Don't forget about our promotion with Amazon. You log on to our website, hazardground.com. You can click on the Amazon button at the bottom of the homepage or under the sponsors tab. You do all your normal Amazon shopping. We'll get a percentage of what you guys spend. And then we donate a percentage of that back to some of the great charities and organizations you've heard featured here on the Hazard Ground. Oh, by the way, it works also on your smartphone. So if you go to hazardground.com, your smartphone, it'll redirect you to the uh, Amazon app. So all of your credit card information, everything is saved. So you don't have to worry about that. Makes it really easy and convenient. With all that out of the way, let's get on to this week's guest, who is a former Marine captain, graduate of the Naval Academy. He was a rifle platoon leader in Vietnam and an artillery battery commander. He went on to serve on the boards of the National Defense University and the Naval Academy. He currently, and get this resume, is a lawyer, corporate executive, and leadership coach. He is the author of a book called Quiet Quiet Cadence, which is a fact-based fiction story about his time in Vietnam. He is Mark Trainer joining us on the Hazard Ground podcast. Mark, welcome, and thank you so much for being here. Thanks, Mark. I really appreciate the opportunity. Always love to talk to our Vietnam vets. You know, one of the things that we've uh, discovered in doing this podcast uh, is that, you know, those stories, uh, as we move away, you know, I mean, it's been 40-plus years since Vietnam, but uh, those stories are still so poignant and still so important today. Uh, and as this next generation of veterans rolls through, you know, there there becomes that connection between the war on terror veterans and the Vietnam veterans. And it's it's great to bridge that gap all these years later. No question about that. And in fact, uh, that has been a very fascinating and gratifying thing that I've found uh, after the Naval Institute Press uh, published my novel, which, as you said, Mark, is uh, about a, a Marine in Vietnam. Um, but it is also the second half of the book is about after his return home and the few years after that and what it was like for him to to kind of get past uh, uh, things that had happened in Vietnam. And um, I have had any number of Afghanistan and Iraq vets tell me that the book is really about them, which is just a tremendous thing that uh, it shows you the commonality of uh, 40 or 50 years difference um, in time, but not in uh, not in what we did as young men. Yeah, well, I, I think it speaks to the idea that combat is combat no matter when you fought it, right? And and there's a certain uh, stress level of combat that never changes. Uh, it, it, when when your life is constantly on the line like that, um, there, there's always going to be that, that commonality there between uh, any generation of veterans. But uh, let's start back at the beginning for you. A Vermont kid growing up, and how would you end up at the Naval Academy and, and in the Marine Corps? Uh always wanted to go to one of the service academies from the time I was a little kid and uh, um, was very fortunate that uh, I scored well on an exam that they had in the state when I was between my junior and senior year in high school. That was back in 1963. And then in the summer of 64, while well, George Aiken, the senator, uh, appointed me to Navy. And uh, so I traveled for the first time uh, below New York City. I'd never been south of New York City. And uh, when I got to Annapolis in plebe summer, I thought I had dropped directly into a soggy, wet hell of various imaginings. <laughs> um, and it kind of went from there. And then uh, at that time, about 10% or so of each class was allowed to volunteer to go into the Marine Corps. And I really uh, had a great uh, respect for the Marine officers I had met there, uh, knew a fair bit of Marine Corps history by that time. and. Uh, 
uh, and of course Vietnam was uh, was roaring along, and uh, so I got my commission in, in the Marine Corps. Um, those numbers are interesting because while it was about 10% back then, it's about 25% of the class now. And I think they turn away young people every year that want to uh, want to be Marines. What year did you end up graduating from the academy? 68. Okay, so n- nothing about the specter of Vietnam deterred you from the service academy at all? No, in fact, Vietnam really started the uh, uh, Gulf of Tonkin incident we reported in in June of 1964, the Gulf of Tonkin incident took place, which is kind of the kickoff of the war, uh, in August of 64. So from that point on, you know, we always knew that we were we were definitely a war class. And uh, um, the first Marines went into Vietnam in January or February of 65. I don't recall which month. And um, so if you uh, if you wanted to be a Marine, you knew where you were headed. So as you're going through your time in the Naval Academy, you knew you were going to be a a war class, as you said. But was anybody sort of second guessing that decision? Were there any rumblings from people as you were going through your four years there that like, hey, you know, uh, this isn't exactly what I thought I was going to end up getting into? Oh, yeah, there was uh, there was a fair amount of that. And the attrition rate in our class was probably close to uh, probably close to about a third. Um, we had over 1,200 enter in the summer of '64, and I and we graduated 800 something. Now, now that wasn't all people that left because they didn't want to be part of a war class, and um, you know, and a lot of the folks uh, weren't going to uh, weren't necessarily going to go to combat positions anyhow. Uh, it depended on on what you did in the Navy versus the Marine Corps. All the pilots would, of course, and many of the many of the black shoe Navy guys uh, would end up going over, volunteering to go over on uh, on things like swift boats and river patrol craft and stuff like that. Um, but there were still plenty of folks that uh, could spend time on destroyers and cruisers and aircraft carriers and submarines. Um, but there were I I knew a number of people who. Uh, in uh, late 67, um, just made the decision that they weren't going to go into the Marine Corps. We had a very interesting uh, situation at the academy where if you walk into Bancroft Hall, which is the major building at the academy, it's got a gigantic, beautiful marble rotunda as you go in up the big steps there, and there's a memorial hall up behind that. And starting in uh, right after the war started, whenever uh, an alumni was killed in Vietnam, they took a copy of uh, his photo and write up his bio write up from uh, uh, the uh, the yearbook of his graduating class, and they posted it on a um, on a big board in uh, in the. Uh, Rotunda. So you walk by that continually. And of course, the board grew and grew until it was multiple boards um, by late 67 or 68. And then back in those days, we selected service branch and uh, for the guys going in the Navy, the ship they were going on and things like that in late February of your senior year. And uh, so we selected um what branch we were going to go into, Marines versus Navy, a couple of weeks, maybe a week or 10 days or so after Ted of 68. And I know a couple of guys that just decided that they weren't going to go into the Marine Corps because of, uh, you know, how the board had kind of filled up during that period around Ted um, with guys from previous classes that had been killed. Um, So, uh, you know, the folks folks that wanted to go really wanted to go. Yeah, I would say so. Did you look at them differently because they made that decision, or were you okay with it? You understood it. Well, I guess uh, I wanted to be a Marine badly enough that um, I, I knew one guy that uh, uh, his fiance said that if he was going to choose the Marines instead of the Navy, she wouldn't marry him. And <laughs> I used to half kid him that he made the wrong decision when he went in the Navy. But, uh, you know, I everybody had to make their own choices on what they wanted to do and how they wanted to serve. And every single guy in the class served in one way or the other. And of course it was all guys then, but, uh, 
um, you know, the folks that stuck with the idea that they wanted to be Marines really wanted to be Marines. You graduate what, May 68 time frame? June 5th of 68. June 5th of 68. How quickly do you end up in Vietnam? Uh, well, all new Marine lieutenants, all new second lieutenants go through something called the basic school, mm-hmm. which is uh, about a six month program uh, at Marine Corps Base Quantico in uh, Northern Virginia. And it basically teaches you all the all the uh, basics of being a, a supposedly a good Marine officer with an emphasis on infantry training, of course. Um, they do it differently now. I digress for a second, and I think actually much better. Uh, all the new lieutenants still go through a, a six-month course, but those that are going to be infantry officers uh, go to a follow-on, I think it's now three months, specifically of infantry officers training. And um, that's a pretty grueling training. My oldest son went through that uh, back in the 90s. Um our class, like I said, it was usually about a six month uh, go for the classes there at the basic school. We did it in 19 and a half weeks, um, worked every Saturday and we graduated on New Year's Eve of 68. And uh, uh, at least those of us that were infantry for the most part ended up in Vietnam about three or four weeks later. Wow. Now, where were you headed? Did you know where you were going or you just got on a plane and you were going to figure it out as you were going along? Uh, well, I, I flew to uh, Okinawa um, and we spent, uh, I guess, either four or five days on Okinawa before we flew south to uh, to actually go to Vietnam. And those days on Okinawa, were, you know, we spent the mornings uh, uh, as officers. We were we were pretty loosely uh, told what we could and couldn't do while we were there. So we PT'd and we went to the range and shot weapons and. And then by four o'clock in the afternoon, we were generally sitting in the bar uh, watching um, uh, Bonanza on a very small black and white TV screen up on the bar. And because it was broadcast from an Okinawan station, the Armed Forces radio folks had a had a radio speaker next uh, about a foot away from the TV set, which translated it because what was on TV was in Japanese. But the tape, which ran almost concurrently, but not quite, was in English. So you'd kind of hear as you're standing there with your beer in your hand, uh, Haas Cartwright, Cartwright saying to uh, to somebody else, uh, Ohio Gazimus Haas, or something like that, you know. And over here, it would be, good morning, Haas, coming out of the, uh, the radio speaker. So that was interesting. But to get to your point about did I know where I was going or how did I get there? Uh, I was actually called into a major's office one day in personnel. And uh, I stood in front of his desk, myself and another lieutenant. And he said, okay, men, uh, pick a color, green or red. So green being my favorite color, I picked green. He reached into his drawer. And this is literally true. He reached into his drawer, pulled out a green dart, turned around on the wall behind his desk. He had a, uh, a dartboard and it was marked one, three, one, three, one, three, one, three, which was stood for the first Marine division of the third Marine division. He threw the dart, it hit one. So I went to the first Marine division. So it was a pretty scientific way of getting me uh, to where I was going to go in Vietnam. <laughs> you know, it, it's funny. We don't do things like that anymore, but sometimes I feel like we should. Um, but yeah, that's a, uh, uh, it's, that's fate taking a hand right there, right? I guess. Yeah, you know. <laughs> it, it, it could have gone to either one, and that's right. Where it worked, you know, it, it was was uh, there was no one else who in the office at the time when you did this, or did other people? Just, just the other lieutenant. He, he, what, he, did, he get, did he get third battalion? He got third division. Yeah, third actually. division. Okay, yeah. so do you know what happened to him? Uh, yes, I saw him at a reunion a couple of years ago. Oh. Uh, yeah. Yeah, he was an infantry officer and came back and uh, uh, went on, as I recall, to be a, uh, a police officer and eventually a chief of police in a small in a town out west. And I hadn't seen him since, uh, I guess, since that day on Okinawa in January of 1969. And I saw him at our 50th basic school reunion uh, uh, two years ago. 
That's amazing. Did you yeah. guys compare notes and stories as to where he went? Did you find out where he went? Uh, he went to a recon unit in uh, up north, um, but I don't know a great deal more about it beyond that. Oh, okay. I was I was so curious. Like the serendipity, you know, like the the the, the that movie Sliding Doors, you know, the paths yeah. take and everything. I was just curious if you ever had any sort of uh, idea of where he ended up. Right. So you headed to a uh, first division, uh, which yeah. is going to where in Vietnam? Uh, in the Da Nang area. First okay. division was headquartered in Da Nang, and then at division I was assigned to the Fifth Marine Regiment, which operated out of a, um, a base called An Hoa. Uh, out towards the Arizona Territory, past Da Nang, um, going, I guess it'd be west towards Laos. I wonder, you know, I, I talk about this a lot, not only uh, with with soldiers that I'm, I'm dealing with now as part of my service, but e- even when you talk about deployment experience, the gap between training and reality, um, we have a hard time now doing it. And I think we are more prepared for combat now than you guys could have ever been back then. But is, was there a moment when you get on the ground in Vietnam, you're in Da Nang, and you're, you're looking around, and you're going, there's nothing I could have done to prepare for this? I think it came a little bit later. Um, you know, from Da Nang, uh, I, uh, I flew out to An Hoa and um, had about uh, three or four days on the ground there before I went out to the bush. So I was behind wire, as we called it. Uh, um, for that period of time. And I was assigned to a company there. And um, that time was all spent doing, again, f- uh, familiarization, firing with weapons and uh, uh, more emergency first aid courses, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, ambush uh, preparation uh, for patrols and um, a fair amount of time, uh, you know, dealing with what to do about booby traps and landmines and that kind of thing. So had those days there and uh, um, actually had a very interesting time going out to pick up the platoon I was assigned to. Uh, there was a small convoy, it had three tanks on it that was going to go out an old dirt road towards the area where the company I was going to pick up or was, was going to join um, was in the bush. And uh so we went out and rode on this road for a while. I sat on the back of the tank getting all mud churned and everything. And uh, um, the other tanks went ahead and I got down off the tank and was standing there beside it. And it stayed with me because it wouldn't have been a really good idea to just have this one guy standing out in the middle of nowhere. And um, I could see the platoon coming toward or the whole company coming towards me, snaking its way across uh, the hills and the rice paddies and uh, it was going to cross this road to where they were going to set up for that night. And um, the, uh, the company commander uh, got up to me and um, the whole group looked like they'd just been put through the ringer. They'd been out in the bush forever. And uh, um, you know, they were filthy torn uniforms, a couple guys pretty bloody because they just evacuated, uh, a few medevaced, a few guys that had been uh, hit with an IED, uh, as we call them today, booby traps. And um, uh, so he says, OK, Lieutenant, fall in behind the radio men here and I'll introduce you to your platoon when we get up to the hilltop, which was a ways off. So I, I said, fine. And I, I got in behind the radios and we go along for about another 45 minutes or an hour and we stop for a cigarette and water break or something. and. Uh, This young Marine comes walking up to me and I'm thinking, okay, here it comes. Uh, I, you know, I'm, I look like I just robbed an army Navy surplus store. All my uniforms are brand new. These guys look light years different from that. He's got several days worth of beard on his face and all. And he looks at me and he says, Hey, Lieutenant, I'm thinking, okay, first test out here with the new guys. And, uh, and of course, I looked about 13 at the time, too, I think. So that wasn't a big help. And um, uh, he says, uh, is your name Trainer?" And I said, yes. Do I know you, Marine? And he said, uh, no, sir, you don't. But I was three years behind you in high school. Um, talk about small world, 7,000 miles away from Rutland, Vermont. And here's a 
a 19 year old guy in the middle of a rice paddy talking to me and uh, he'd been in a class with my brother in high school. And your brother's younger than you, obviously. Yeah. Yeah. That's incredible, man. I guess I kind of, kind of circling around here to your question. I, I think, you know, when I ran, well, the very first day, as I recall that I was out there, um, I had an interesting experience where uh, there was sudden this gi- suddenly this gigantic explosion from the hill next to us, maybe a quarter of a mile away. And um, we knew that uh, Ann Arvin, a uh, South Vietnamese unit, had been camped over there until sometime that day, and then they had left to go someplace else. And uh, uh, there was this gigantic explosion and we all stood there looking towards that hill, wondering what was going on. And suddenly this body flew up in the air and it went out, actually went above the treetops and just kind of hung there for a minute and then fell back down. And nobody was ever certain what had, what had happened. It was almost certain that the, uh, the South Vietnamese soldiers had booby trapped their trash when they left. Um, Villagers used to go scrounging in the trash to see what they could find, you know, anything from cardboard to patch holes in their hooches with to uh, scraps of food and stuff like that. Um, you know, we kind of kind of hoped and semi speculated that maybe it was a VC that had gotten there at the wrong time and uh, and had tripped a landmine or a booby trap that was meant for uh, for the Marines. But um uh, I'd be 90% certain that it was probably an innocent villager that had gotten blown up by uh, by South Vietnamese soldiers because he happened to be in the wrong place at the wrong time. And that was, you know, you ask if there was ever a moment when I said, I'm not really prepared for this. I don't think I said I wasn't really prepared, but I remember thinking, you know, this is a whole hell of a lot different from what we talked about back in the States, you know when this kind of thing happens. And then the next day I ran my first patrol as a Lieutenant in charge of a, of a platoon. And, um, that was relatively uneventful, but, uh, you know, we, uh, we didn't have anybody hurt, didn't actually get in a firefight or anything, but, but it was kind of pucker time in the sense that, okay, this, this is it. This is real at this stage. When do you have that first event where somebody gets injured or killed? Um, it was a few, uh, a few patrols later where uh, um, we walked through an area and a uh, a guy tripped a booby trap and got blown up very badly. That was also the first time I was shot at because I called in a uh, medevac chopper and, um, you know, we circled everybody up in a defensive perimeter and did everything you needed to do, try and, uh, try and, uh, uh, Help the the wounded Marine as much as we could. And um, uh, then when the chopper came in, get him on the chopper and all. And it was an interesting lesson there because as soon as the chopper took off, um, some bad guy who was on another hill removed from us sprayed the entire area. And I will never forget that day, first day I was shot at. The reason I won't forget it, I think, is because where we were standing was kind of like a, a... garden uh almost like you'd see a potato patch in the in the states with i don't know what was planted there but there were actually rows and mounds of stuff and suddenly the mound that i was standing beside and it had rained before the mound that i was standing beside suddenly just started spitting dirt all over me and um you know it took me a millisecond to realize that uh uh somebody had just shot and missed me and my legs by uh, a relatively uh a small amount of space. And I was pretty glad for that, but I also got down behind the mound pretty quickly too. (laughs) Um, As you start to do more and more of these um, and you start to make more contact with the enemy, uh, casualties start to to mount. Do you feel like there's a sense of not even not so much, what are we doing here? But like, there's no way the odds are in our favor. Like I'm not going to get out of this thing alive. Mark, I guess I would I would answer that with a slightly different approach. It wasn't so much that I or or the men I was leading uh, 
could make it through firefights or actual engagements with the enemy. What was really tough in the area that I worked in is that it was so heavily booby-trapped that uh, we would go days where we'd have men wounded or killed by a booby trap and never see anybody to shoot at. And, um, you know, if you run patrol after patrol after patrol like that, uh, that really works on your brain housing group that, uh, you know, you can't fight a booby trap. You can try and avoid them as best you can by trying to, to walk and, and have the patrol go where, uh, uh, or you think it's less likely they're going to get set, but, um, uh, you know, you still, at least in my experience, we couldn't avoid them. And, um, uh, and it was random too. It wasn't just the point, the, uh, point man that, uh, that was going to be my next question. That was going to be my next question about the person running point. Did they, were they the ones who always got hit? Cause it seems natural yeah. that they would be. No, I mean, it there, there was, there was sometimes the second, third, fourth guy in line. I, um, the guy that, that got blown up on the patrol I was talking about when you asked about the first casualties and all, um, I think he was like the fourth or fifth guy through this uh, tree line that we were going through uh, in single single file column. And, um, you know, it would sometimes be the point man, but... Uh, uh, you know, I, I recall times when uh, it was the second or third guy in, in line that actually uh, actually triggered it or had it triggered. What was your personal philosophy on where you wanted to be while you were patrolling as far as within your platoon, within your column? Were you somebody who wanted to be at the front? Did you like to stay at the middle? Did you stay at the back? Uh, usually it depended on... on um, how many men we had and all. I, I usually like to be uh, no more than a third of the way back in the column. So if we were out with three squads, for example, um, I'd want to be right there uh, behind the first squad. That way, if we, if we got into a fight, I could control all three squads, fairly, or, or at least direct all three squads fairly well with the two of them behind me. So I usually had the squad right in front of me um, and then myself and my radio operator and then uh, our two machine gun teams right behind me so that, you know, I could get them. I say I could get them where I wanted them. The truth of the matter is those guys knew what they were doing so well that it didn't take a lot of instruction on my part uh, um, to put the machine guns where we needed them if we were in a fight. Um you know, and if it were a smaller group, then sometimes I'd want to be a little bit closer to the front so I could see what was going on a little bit better. But uh, uh, most of the time, probably in the upper third. Did it ever change? I mean, or, or you kind of were at the beginning that were you in one spot and then morphed to another? And the only I asked is because you, you talk about booby traps. It's the equivalent of the IEDs in Iraq and Afghanistan. When I first started out running the convoys that I ran, I always just put myself in the middle for what I always felt was the best command and control. Um, but by about a month or so in, I wanted to be in the front vehicle. I wanted to be the lead vehicle. I wanted to run point. I felt like I could control things most from there, that most of the contact that we did see and ever saw was always at the front half of a convoy. Um, and so I always felt more comfortable there um, and, and being able to make sure that anybody behind me could always catch up. But it was one of those things where, uh, if if somebody got hit, I just felt like I was in a defenseless position being in the middle or at the back of a convoy. I just spitballing philosophy, so to speak. Yeah, I, I can understand that. And I think in the convoy sense, that makes a lot of sense. Um, I think if you've got a rifle platoon and, and you've got, depending on the time and the circumstances and how many casualties, you, casualties you've had and stuff like that, uh, you know, you might have from 18 to 30 guys there. And I think that I always felt that if I were back a little ways, um, then, you know, I could bring the entire power of, of the entire group to bear. Uh, if we, if we got hit from the front and of course it wasn't always the front you were going to get hit from, uh, um, 
although I guess it probably worked out mostly that way and uh, when we actually had contact with the enemy. Um, I think that, uh, you know, if, if the circumstances were different, um, I didn't work in, in deep uh, jungle canopy. Um, some of my friends did, uh, if they were up north, uh, for example, where you really had to cut your way through it and all. I think if that were the case, I probably would have chosen to be right up there, one of the first three or four guys, because you could really see what was going on and tell what was going on much better than if you had six or eight guys in front of you. Um, but I still think that's a little bit of a tough call because the big thing that a lieutenant has to do, I think, is uh, is as much as possible influence the situation. Mm -hmm. And what that really means is be in a position where you can move people to where you think everybody needs to be to accomplish whatever it is that you're going to do. You know, if you're in an assault and you want to get everybody online, um, you don't want to have to wait for the for three quarters of the platoon to catch up with you to to go forward. You want everybody online attacking at the same time. Um, so I guess that that would have been my philosophy on uh, on where I position myself. Um, you know, but it's not a static thing either. As something happened, as the point man spotted something, I would always walk up to to the point to find out what was going on. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know, if we ran into anything, I was always up at the, the front part so that I could call in artillery or work airstrikes and that kind of thing. Uh, it, well, I was there at, at the beginning of the deployment. Most of the IEDs were uh, they weren't command detonated at that point. They used something tripped them off. And so I always felt like it was if somebody was going to get hit in my platoon or my 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 convoy, rather platoon, my convoy, at least it would have been me who tripped it as opposed to somebody else. Um now that changed a lot with with the command detonated ones because typically it was harder to hit the first vehicle. If you have a four or five vehicle convoy, you're more likely in trouble in the middle. But I was kind of used to being at the front at that point in time, so no, nobody questioned it from that standpoint. But uh, but I digress. All right, so uh, you're going through everything uh, in Vietnam. Uh, is there a, a mission or anything else that sort of sticks out with you um, that that I don't want to use the word haunts, but you know, just kind of. Um, stays with you after all these years? Was there a patrol or anything that sort of um, is one of those moments that that just uh, lingers for you for your experience there? I guess there are probably a, a couple of them. One is uh, one is um, on the humorous side, and that was the first real firefight that I was in. Um, you know, it as you uh, know, at least as well as I do, you don't really have a great deal of time to be to be scared or anything. You're you're functioning at that stage. It's afterwards, at least it always was for me. It was afterwards that I began to think, holy crap, what, what did I just do there? Um, but the very first firefight that I was in, uh, you know, I had the whole platoon and we went uh, charging forward to get up again. We had, we had been hit by a small group of... Uh, of uh, NVA and um, uh, so we went running forward to get down behind a rice paddy dike to be able to shoot back and and then eventually work a uh, um, a group in uh, uh, in a uh, uh, encircling move on them. Um, but as I went tearing forward, now I've been shot at before, but this was the first time that there was a lot of stuff going on. Tracers from uh, an enemy machine gun went flying past my head and it was kind of like this orange green line of, of blurbs of light that were probably within about three or four inches of my ear. And I know this sounds crazy and it is in fact crazy, but I had this strangest sensation that I could actually lift my hand and it would be like a Saturday morning cartoon of catching you know, neon blurbs floating through the air next to my head. And of course, uh, you know, that whole line of tracers meant that uh, every 10th bullet or eighth or 10th bullet was a, was a tracer. So that meant that there were eight or 10 in between. And so I had, I don't know, a dozen scores 
uh, bullets just uh, flash by my head and I have this weird thought it, in a split second as, I, as I'm running forward. And later on, after the fight was over and all, I was thinking to myself, not only was that the dumbest damn thing you've ever thought in your entire life, but if that uh, NBA machine gunner had sneezed or burped or shaken his head for for a split second and and just moved a a, a hair's breadth on uh, on the barrel of his machine gun, he would blow my head off. And you know, so as afterwards, I was kind of the cold chills thinking about that. So, so that was one. I I think another one that uh, um was a ways afterwards when uh, uh, we got in a fight and um, uh, killed a couple of, of enemy and there was one that was wounded and uh, we'd been through a very tough time with booby traps for uh, quite a period before that. And this was the first time we'd really had contact. And, um, uh, you know, we were all, all pretty, uh, pretty angry and pretty uh, vengeful. Um, you know, you run a number of patrols and uh, over a few week period and you medevac somebody or, or send somebody out uh, in a body bag every time that you run a patrol and you see nothing to shoot at, it doesn't make you a happier person by any stretch. And uh, mm -hmm. um, so we had this, we had this little fight and uh, then we got the word that uh, they wanted the wounded NVA brought back in so that uh, the intelligence folks could um, could uh, question him. And, um, uh, but they couldn't send a helicopter out for him. And so we were in, we were in real bad guy country at that point. So we had to um, put him on a makeshift litter and carry him through calf deep mud and rice paddies for a long period of time with hills around us where I was just convinced after all the noise we'd made before that in the fight that, uh, you know, there were going to be guys coming up on top of the hills and gunning my platoon. And uh, turned out we made it the entire way back without anybody else uh, getting hurt or even getting shot at again, as I recall. Um, but that was one that has really kind of, kind of stuck in my head as a, as a, really tough moment and something that um, uh, I didn't want to do. And I didn't have anything nice to say to the guy that we were carrying. That's for damn sure. Was it because you would have rather left him there to die or because the thought the request was unreasonable? Can you elaborate more on that? Yeah, I thought that uh, it was a combination. I was happy to leave him there to die, although the corpsman didn't think that he was going to. So that would have been that could have been a problem um but uh, you know he was wounded but he could recover if if the other bad guys found him and got him someplace to patch him up but at the time i i had the thought that you know the the guys back in the rear that want this this guy for questioning <clears throat> and they may well have have had good reasons as i look back on it now you know they may well have had good reasons for or wanting to get him in there to try and get intel about what was going on in the whole area. Um, on the other hand, uh, I had lost a number of guys over the prior few weeks. And um, to think that I was going to be responsible to have to carry this, uh, this shot up uh, enemy soldier, have my guys carry this shot up enemy soldier across this open area a uh, very lengthy open area with uh, with us having to move very slowly and having to be very quiet because we couldn't put out flankers. The hills were too far away uh, to put out flankers. And, um, you know, just waiting to see if we were going to get shot down in, uh, or get shot at there in the, uh, in the middle of the rice paddies without any place to really get much cover. And um, uh, it just infuriated me. I, I was just wild because I thought, um, you know, God, I've just, I've lost a bunch of guys and now I'm being put in a position where I can easily lose more. And, uh, um, it just, it just didn't seem right at the time, you know, in retrospect, I have no idea why they, what the Intel types wanted the guy for back in the rear. Maybe they had real good reasons for it, but 
you know, when you're a young lieutenant out there with a bunch of uh, of uh, your troops that um, you're doing your best to try and keep alive and you feel tremendously responsible for everything that happens to them. Um, that was a, that was a tough day. And I, uh, I, uh, I won't say I, I came close to doing something very bad with the guy out there, but um, I sure wanted to. Did any of your guys come up to you and talk to you and say, you know, Hey, hey Lieutenant, look, you know, just express fears, concerns, um, you know, were they, were, were they breaking down? Was, was combat stress becoming a thing for them after being there for so many, for so long of a time and seeing so many casualties Did any, anything like that happen to you? You know, in this specific instance, um, nobody broke down or anything, but you know, several guys just said, you know, this is insane. <clears throat> we shouldn't have to be carrying this guy in. It's going to get us killed. And, and, you know, Lieutenant, if you go along with it, you're going to get us killed, which, which was a pretty tough thing to, to, uh, to deal with. But, um, you know, the choices were to, uh, to leave the guy and, and lie about it and say that he had died or to kill him. And, uh, um, I wasn't going to let anybody do that because, uh, as much as I wanted to, um, I, I did believe that you shouldn't be killing prisoners. Um, so in that, on that particular patrol, in that particular instance, no. And I will say that um, I never had anybody break down and, uh, uh, you know, fall apart, uh, um, at least that anybody could could see who knows who did what at night uh, if they were on watch by themselves in a foxhole and how they were feeling. But, um, you know, I just have such tremendous respect for all those young enlisted guys that uh, spent month after month after month out there in the bush and um, just living through that. And you kind of have to compartmentalize it all and, and say, you know, okay, that was yesterday and I'm going to get up and, and do what I have to do tomorrow. Um, you know, I, I think that's one of the things um, that I care a great deal about. And one of the things that, um, I, you know, I, I'm not on, on your, on your show here to flack my book, but one of the things I tried very hard in the book to convey was just that sense of what we ask of our young people when we send them to war and how, amazing they are that they can get up and do it day after day after day in awfully damn tough circumstances. Absolutely. How, how does the deployment end for you? I mean, how long were you there for and sort of what's the culmination of it? Um, I, I spent 12 months. Uh, yeah. 12 months. Uh, second part of the tour though, I was, uh, uh, most officers spent uh, several months out in the bush and then, were rotated back to the rear to various jobs. And uh, um, so I spent my last few months just pushing papers and- uh, Did it bother you you rotated out of the bush? Yeah, yeah. Why? Um, well, it wasn't what I was there to do. Uh, and, and I actually, uh, I ended up having to leave the bush early instead of being there for six or seven months. I was only there for a few. Um, because I developed a problem with, uh, with the bones in my feet. Um, actually, I probably didn't develop it at that time. That's the way I like to think about it now. But uh, at my pre-commissioning physical, um, when the doctor asked me uh, what branch of the service I was going to go in, I said the Marine Corps. And he said, well, that's great. Just don't be an infantry guy. And I said, why not? And he says, because you got feet that aren't going to make it, you know, if you're going to have to walk all day carrying all kinds of crap. Um, and I, of course, was much smarter than any medical doctor, and I wanted to be an infantry officer, so off I went. It turned out, and that's why I changed artillery when I came back to the States, because I just knew I wasn't going to make it long-term as an infantry officer. So, yeah, that bothered me. Um, I, you know, in many ways, I kind of felt like I didn't do everything I went over to do. Um, <clears throat> and then... Uh, uh, flew back in January, and um, uh, I guess by February, I was out at Fort Sill. The Marine Corps doesn't have it, so I wanted to stay in the combat arms. 
but uh, had gotten permission to switch from the infantry to artillery. And I figured it'd be uh, smarter for me to uh, to uh, ride in a Jeep as part of an artillery battery than to try and hump around with hundred and something pounds on my back all the time. Um, so I went out to Fort Sill because uh, the Marine Corps doesn't have its own uh, own uh, artillery school. Um, it sends all its uh, artillery officers out there. So we had quite a group. There were 99 of us in the course. 49 of us were Marine officers. Um, to say we terrorized the Army guys might be a slight exaggeration, but only slightly. Yeah. Uh, um, <laughs> Several of several of us were uh, tobacco chewers, and I have a very fond memory of um, standing in a school circle one day with an army captain. I was one of the senior guys because I was the first lieutenant at the time. Most of the other uh, lieutenants were right out of uh, the basic school. And, um, the three or four of us that were tobacco chewers at the time, filthy habit, but it was great at the time. Um, <laughs> uh, Passed around pouches of red man and beech nut and yeah, I'm gu- guilty as charged from my early days of my yes, career. Sir. Yes, sir. And all 49 of us stood there spitting into the middle of the circle while the <laughs> captain was trying to instruct us on some kind of gear or something. So they, uh, you know, we, we all had a good, good, uh, good inner service rivalry between the army and the Marines all in good sport and good fun. And, uh, but I think the Marines took the seven out of the top 10 places in the class when we graduated. So we all felt pretty good about that too. And for the, uh, for the civilians listening, Fort Sill, Oklahoma is the home of the artillery school for the army. And as uh, Mark just mentioned before, kind of co-opted by some of the other branches for uh, uh, their artillery training. So yeah, uh, it, it, it's owned by the army, but certainly uh, at least not when you were there, was it? Uh, so after you finish <laughs> artillery school, what's next for you? Um, I went to uh, the 2nd Marine Division at Camp Lejeune, mm-hmm. and uh, I commanded an artillery battery there. Uh, that was a great experience. It was a uh, 155 self-propelled battery. So for folks that don't know what that is, it's, it looks kind of like a gigantic tank with a huge cannon on the front of it, and, and you can drive it in a lot of different places. In fact, we did a – back in the day when you could uh, shoot up some of the islands uh, – that we used for target ranges in the Caribbean. We spent about six weeks uh, on a ex- jungle exercise, um, shooting artillery all over the place down on Viegas, just off of Cuba down there. Um, and then after I'd been uh, the artillery battery commander for a while, I got selected to be the uh, the aide to the commanding general of the second Marine division. And I was his aide um, for a bunch of months, which was a, an amazing experience for a, uh, you know, I guess I was probably uh, 23 at the time and uh, be at the the right hand of a guy uh, that was running, a, I think it was like 28,000 man division spread around two or three different places in the world and get to do so many of the things with him and uh, go see so many things and do so many things. It was a tremendous education. And of course, and some of those guys were, were, uh, were just magnificent old warriors. And um, uh, I was telling somebody just the other day about a meeting that I went to with the general I was an aide for. And uh, he had been one of the guys that had gone over the wall at Incheon in Korea. Um, He'd been in World War II. He'd fought in Korea. He'd been a regimental commander in Vietnam. Uh, I always like to think of him the most of – that famous picture of the Marines going over the wall in Incheon, that's, he's there. Um, so the meeting was with him, the assistant commandant of the Marine Corps, who was General Ray Davis, Medal of Honor winner from the Chosin River Reservoir campaign and uh, uh, in Korea, and uh, General Rathbun uh, Tompkins, who had fought at both uh, um, Tinian and uh, uh, Tarawa. And, um, you know, I was just in awe being around these guys, you know, young 23 year old uh, first lieutenant. I think I spent most of the time trying to cover the bruises on my jaw from where my chin had dropped and hit the floor every time I went to a meeting with one of these guys, or all three of those guys. So that was a pretty neat time. And then after that, uh, I, I was transferred to Quantico and I taught. Uh, 
leadership and weapons and tactics to the new lieutenants uh, as a captain at that time. That was so, a great way to end up my tour in the Marine Corps. I was going to say, shortly after this, you're, you're deciding to end your Marine Corps career. Why? You know, I had a love affair with the Marine Corps. And if you had asked me three plus years in to sign for 30, I would have done it on the line. And then I just got thinking, you know, the war had wound down by that point. And uh, not that I'm a warmonger, but um, uh, it, had, it had worn down. And I began thinking about other things that I could do. And um, they turned out to be things that you couldn't do wearing a uh, uniform. So I decided to leave the Marines and go to law school. And uh, at the time I went to law school, I thought I was probably going to go back and work uh, for the federal government. And as it turns out, life takes other turns. And I ended up going on and being a, a litigator and a corporate lawyer instead of uh, going back into the government. Although I have been very fortunate, I was able to do, like you said in the introduction, uh, a few different things that mm -hmm. allowed me to make a tiny contribution on the uh, national security front. I think. Yeah. I mean, that's, uh, I didn't really wasn't able to get into your entire bio in the introduction, but, uh, and I do want to kind of just get the, you know, how you got to where, but you served on the board of the national defense university and the Naval Academy. Yeah. Uh, you're also currently the chairman uh, of the board, non-executive of the vitreous investment partners, uh, which uh, a publicly traded company, a uh, member of the Council on Foreign and Senior Fellow of the American Leadership Forum, served as a member of the boards, I just mentioned that before, uh, along with National Defense University, U.S. Naval Academy, University of Maryland School of Law, U.S. Chamber of Concert Institute for Legal Reform, Chair of the Advisory Committee, the Export Import Bank of the United States. I mean, look, I can keep going on and on here. Uh, you've got a lengthy, lengthy resume of all these things that you've done. Um, I want to focus on the part with, you know, working back at the Naval Academy. Was that something that sort of happened organically or was that sort of a goal of yours to, to get back to the Academy to work there or at least be connected to it in some way? Uh, well, I always uh, enjoyed going back to the Academy and, and, you know, just being involved on the edges of things. But uh, I had already been on the, or I was, at the time on the board of the National Defense University, which is a marvelous organization for any of your listeners that don't know, it's the it's the umbrella group for things like the National War College and the Industrial College of the Armed Forces and Joint Forces Staff College and uh, a number of other schools. And it's a it's a wonderful institution. I was fortunate enough to uh, to be on that board, and um, I had. Uh, an opening came up. I, I didn't even know about this. An opening came up on the uh, uh, board at the Naval Academy for one of the slots that is filled by presidential appointment. And uh, George W. Bush was a president at the time. And I had a couple connections there. And, and one day um, uh, I was asked by somebody in the White House personnel office if I would consider um, <laughs> Uh, taking an appointment on that board and, you know, it was kind of like, don't throw me in that briar patch. Yeah. I'd love to do that. Um, so that's how that all came about. Uh, by the way, uh, shameless plug for me. You got any pull at the war college? Cause I still need my slot. I haven't quite gotten it yet. <laughs> if you got any pull, just, you know, let somebody know that I'm looking for a, a, an opportunity here. Okay. Uh, thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. On to other things that don't involve my own personal benefit. Um, <laughs> so, uh, in all of this, um, you have all these things going on. Again, you know, you talk about a corporate executive, a leadership coach. Uh, you decide to write a book. A Quiet Cadence is the title of it. Um, it's an undertaking to write a book, man. I, I'm, I'm scared of even thinking about trying to write a book with how much work it takes. So, uh, one, uh, I guess the impetus to it, but two, how do you find the time when you have all these other things going on? Um. I guess I don't sleep much, but, uh, you know, to begin with, you got to be a little bit crazy. It's fiction. It's a novel. So you got to be a little crazy to sit in a room for hours on end, making up conversations between people that don't exist, you know, but then you get to the dinner table and you wonder where the hell's Marty <laughs> I spent four hours with him. How come he's not over here having dinner with us? Um, my wife is a saint. I, I had written 
in bits and pieces, attempted to write, attempted to teach myself to write over the years. And then around uh, 2013 or 14, I got really serious about wanting to write the novel. And uh, um, at that point, the, the work that I was doing um, as the chairman of Virtus, as the executive leadership coach uh, and all, was pretty flexible in the time because um, they were really, by that stage, um, I've been working at, uh, at Mach 1 or Warp 2, whichever speed you want, um, you know, for 30 odd years before that. But by, by that time, the, to, uh, you know, just give up a lot of other things uh, as far as becoming pretty selfish with my own time so that I could I could put my butt in the chair and, and start writing. And uh, when I started writing the book, um, you know, to some degree, uh, it's a bit like digging a ditch. You know, you've just got to do the work. You've got to be there and, and put in the time. And it's not a, at least for me, it's not a, uh, you know, I don't have the ability to j and write a, a pretty, pretty uh, good, pretty smooth uh, for the Naval Inst Press actually took the book. I think I had done I think there were nine cover to cover drafts of it over a three year period. Um, and spent a fair amount of that time too, just dissecting other people's writing uh, in an attempt to teach myself how to write. Um, so, uh, you know, it, it was a matter of, of just bringing a lot of focus to it. Yeah. Was part of the impetus in writing the book, some, were things bubbling up below the surface for you? Were you, um, starting to have, you know, I mean, flashbacks, not the right word, but I mean, did, did thoughts start to resurface? I mean, this is about your experience. And when you write this thing, it's, 35 years later, you know, I mean, it's, it's yeah. a long time. It's not like these memories are all fresh. So was there a reason that something was starting to kind of uh, bubble under the surface that needed, you needed to come up? I'd say, I'd say two different things about that, Mark. One was that um, I had actually been kind of working at, but not as focused as I got in 2013 or 14, working at trying to write a novel, uh, probably for 25 years before that, just in bits and pieces. And um, so I think a lot of the kind of cathartic, cathartic effect of, of putting your thoughts down on a page and all probably took place back in those days, although I had a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of uh, uh, refocused memories and thoughts. And, uh, and the book is fiction, but it's based on... Uh, um, you know, so the characters aren't real. The storyline isn't really real, but it's based on a lot of um, circumstances that either I or people that I was I knew pretty well um, were involved in in many respects, at least in the in the first half of the book and the combat part. Um, what had really gotten me focused, though, I think, is that. Um, I had read a fair amount of war literature and I wasn't aware, and I'm still not today, aware of any novel that had uh, uh, combined a very authentic story about what it was like to be a young enlisted man, the protagonist in the book named Marty McClure is a machine gunner. Um, so he's a PFC and a Lance Corporal. Um, hadn't, hadn't, seen any book and and still haven't that combines that really no holds barred look at the reality of ground combat on the one hand and then the second part of the book dealing with um what it is like to carry the thoughts and uh memories and guilts perhaps of uh of uh, coming home after the war when you've lost uh, a number of friends. And uh, um, and in this instance, of course, it's uh, after a war that, that Marty, the hero of the book, is uh, very convinced the United States just walked away from after putting 58,000 names on the wall in Washington. So I wanted to combine uh, those two stories. One, a, a very realistic 
story of what uh, what we ask of our 18 and 19 year old kids when we send them off to war and what what life is like for them on the one hand and then on the other hand tell the story of a young man who comes home goes to college gets married leads a good life but he still has to deal with what he's got going on in his head about his memories of the war i happen to be someone i did a bunch of work with vietnam vets in the 80s and uh, i happen to be someone who is a fervent believer that you can't go through the intensity of combat without uh, having some sort of post-traumatic stress if you will afterwards. But I firmly believe that for the overwhelming majority of us, it doesn't rise to what I would call a disorder. So I talk about PTS, not PTSD, for the most part, not not totally. I mean, there are a lot of guys that have that have got issues that they need a lot of help with. But I think that one of the things that I was focused on was, and because of a lot of the work that I had done in the eighties with vets, when Vietnam vets were, were dealt with so very badly in the press has gotten a lot better in many respects for our, our current warriors. But, uh, um, I wanted to point out that you can have a guy come home, lead a very good life as a, has been a father, a productive citizen, a good, uh, inside his head, he's still got to wrestle with terribly maimed, um, the survivor guilt of, you know, he was the fourth guy in line, but the third guy was the one that got blown up by the booby trap, that kind of thing. And that's what I was trying to say in the book. And I was trying to say it in a way that, uh, um, people who didn't have an understanding of that, not like, not guys like you and me or our compatriots, but more folks that don't have any experience with that could take a look at it and say, okay, so maybe this is what we're really asking of our young people. Yeah. And, and I think that again, uh, I don't want to pat myself on the back, but that's kind of what this podcast is. It, it, it does the same thing. Yeah. You know, when you give that firsthand account of, of combat, um, it, it, for, for the civilians listening, and I, I often say that, hey, for the civilians listening who haven't had this, this uh, let's call it an opportunity, if you will. Um, but, you know, having been through combat, you know, these are some of the things that, that, that they're dealing with. And, and I think um, they, there, there is a difference between PTS and PTSD. Um, I, I think it's important to note. But I also think that for your generation, it wasn't something that was even ever discussed and even for my generation of veterans, it's something that is discussed really only on the fringes. I mean, it's it's there, it's prevalent, we know what it is, but to many people who still wear a uniform, the idea of admitting, admitting that you have PTSD um, is done for one of two things. One, people do it as sort of a scapegoat to get out of things, um, and they use it incorrectly, and other people never say a word about it because they know it's still a career ender at this point. You know, like it, it, it's still one of those things that can jeopardize your future if you're still wearing the uniform. And so we have this stigma around it that is very much uh, needs to be corrected, very much needs to be addressed in a way that I think your book alludes to. Um, and, and I think some of the, the firsthand accounts that we talk about allude to the same sort of thing. Yeah, I've listened to some of the podcasts where people have talked about that. And I, I think that's that's a, a, a wonderful thing to be addressing. Um, you know, I wonder if you'd agree with me on this. I, I think that we handle it uh, better today than than we ever did 50 years ago. And, and even in some of what would seem like small things, I had lunch yesterday with a, with a fellow that was a two tour Afghanistan vet. And um, we were talking about how when the young guys came, he was a, had been a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps. And, uh, you know, when the, when the young guys came back from Vietnam, they came back as individuals and particularly the guys that, for example, uh, were going to be getting out of this service, 
some of them came back and basically went from the airport to home and that was it. So there was no cooling down period, no period of, uh, you know, a week before they might have been fighting and then they get home and there's no time to get the brain housing group straightened out. Whereas today, yeah, exactly. Better way to put it. Um, You know, what this fellow was telling me was that uh, uh, while uh, he and his buddies were pretty unhappy about it, they didn't get leave as soon as they came home. You know, they came home as a, as a battalion and they were basically locked down at, uh, at um, Camp Lejeune for some period of time um, simply so that they could interact with each other in a peaceful environment um, to give them that decompression time. And I think that in itself has got to help a lot, but I think to your point, um, we have to make it something that is not a career ender unless a guy really has very serious problems because the overwhelming majority of people can get past it, but it takes help. It takes support to get past it, I think. Yeah, and and that's one of the uh, challenges of being a reservist or a guardsman because they have been so pressed into service. And again, it's not better or worse, just different than the active force. But, you know, when your deployment ends – you have, you know, after the week or two you have at your, your demobilization station, you get dropped off and you just go back home. And, yeah. and there is none of that. And and I wasn't good at it after my first deployment, but I was better at it after my second deployment as far as decompressing because I understood what my mind needed to do um, to sort of adjust to regular society again. Now, again, some of that I, I experienced a lot more danger on my first deployment than I did on my second so I was a lot more uh, on edge. Um, I was a lot more apprehensive just about general situations in life. Um, but I, I think the experience of going through it once and then understanding, like you said, understanding what decompression is and how, how critical it is that you don't just try to throw yourself back into normalcy again. Because you can't do it. You can't, you can't go from, you know, it, it's almost like uh, if you're on a NASCAR track, all of a sudden just hitting reverse and trying to go in the other direction. It doesn't work that way. Yep. You know, you're going 180 miles an hour one way. You, you've got to slow down, come to a stop, turn around, and then slowly start ramping back up in the other direction. So, um, and that's where I think a lot of problems, you know, come from um, because the world doesn't seem as normal anymore. And, and you're putting a square peg in a round hole. You got to have time to sort of smooth out the, uh, sand down the edges of that square peg and make it round again. Absolutely. And the world is not the same anymore because uh, of the experiences that you've had. And I mean, even on the small things, um, you know, I, I can remember how pissed off I used to get at people that would complain about little picky own things that uh, I thought were of no importance at all when I got home. And then, you know, it took a while for me to get back to thinking, well, okay, this is the way people are in life. And, uh, um, you know, the fact that the the toaster is on the fritz is uh, is something that does bother them, but it sure in hell isn't important to me. When did you start to realize the similarities between Vietnam vets and post 9-11 vets? Um, I think, uh, you know, I had the good fortune to to meet a number of, of post 9-11 vets and just talking about uh, uh, some of the commonalities that we had. The biggest difference, it seemed to me, was uh, in many respects, was that, um, you know, when they came home, when you all came home, um, you were given a a much better welcome, at least on the surface. But I don't know how much under the surface that went. Again, what you're saying about you don't go from 180 miles an hour to a sudden stop and then then reverse, which in many respects is what civilian life is and all. So um, that was part of it. But it's been much more so since my book has come out because of the contacts that that I've had with people that have read it and uh, and wanted to say they I've had it's, it's been fascinating. I've had any number of guys say they wish they had had the book Um before they deployed and of course some of them were 10 years ago so they didn't come close but uh, um they said because it explained something that told them they really weren't alone you know that uh, that even those of us that fought 50 years ago had to deal with some of the same things 
Yeah, I, I'm curious to get your thoughts. And uh, this is a massive rabbit hole for me when we talk about uh, the military and the reception that we get from the public and everything else. Uh, so I'll try not to pontificate, but I'm curious as to your um reaction to the way vets are treated now as opposed to how you guys were treated um i think it's fair if i was you to be ticked off about it but i know most vietnam vets aren't but i I'm just curious on where you stand on the differences yeah i, I let me kind of ramble at you uh, for a second on that one i'm not in the least bit ticked off about it i'm very glad to see it and in, in an interesting way i think it has also opened the door to some degree for people to talk about and recognize Vietnam vets. You know, it's been, it's become not only okay, but positive to be a veteran. Um, I am, however, a, a bit, maybe more than a bit cynical about, I'm not sure that's the right word. I'm at least skeptical about, uh, um, you know, the, uh, the uh, welcome home uh, thanks for your service to our heroes from people who really don't have a dog in the fight at all. I mean, they've got nothing at stake. And it's just, in some respects, I think it's an unfortunately easy way out for a lot of people who will never serve, who will never have one of their children serve, uh, which is nothing at all very to the very contrary it's nothing at all against the veterans themselves but i can't help but wonder if if the accolades that our vets get are are not as not as deep as well those of, those of us that have been there and done that actually feel about them i mean okay so i feel about a guy who's been in combat in afghanistan or iraq uh i can guarantee you is a hell of a lot uh a uh, uh, stronger, more camaraderie uh, type feeling than uh, somebody who who's had no stake in the game at all. There's been a paradigm shift in the last, let's call it seven, maybe 10 years. You know, when I remember when I came home on mid tour leave for my first deployment um, and uh, I, I had a friend at the time who worked for the New York Islanders. I'm from Long Island and that's where I grew up. And he invited me to a game and uh, he was working. He came down during the game. And he said, Hey, we want to put you on the jumbotron real quick and just say, you know, you know, home from Iraq, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay, fine. And they threw me up on the screen and the entire 18,000 people are screaming USA. It was an awesome moment. Like it's really cool. You know, like back then, you know, in, in this was an 05 when this was going on. Um, it was different. I felt like it was genuine. It was raw. It was emotional. It was a connection there. Um, Fast forward, you know, we've gone from thanking the military to monetizing it and commercializing it. And we are in such a dangerous spot right now with it to me that, uh, you know, every sports team has a military appreciation day, which they don't really tell you is co-opted and sponsored by X advertiser. So th you've now taken this thank you for your service and made it a money making machine for several organizations. And so we are just all of a sudden have become sort of uh, lack of a better term pawns in, in, in pieces for uh, people to use in, in a commercial sense. And I think that at least from what I'm hearing from you, th their skin in the game isn't about our welfare. Their skin in the game is about their business. And I think that's a very dangerous place for us to be. And we don't do anything to stop it. As far as, you know, Department of Defense and the military, we don't do anything to stop it. We, we don't do anything to say, hey, we're not going to be part of that. And now we're being pulled into a political cycle as well on top of all of it. So we've been commercialized, we've been monetized and politicized when in reality, you know, we were never intended to be any of those things. So, I, again, just me pontificating about it. But, it, you know, reasonable hey. mind to choose to disagree. I guess I'd really want to do some, some, th I haven't thought about it in those terms before. Um, I, I think I understand exactly what you're saying there. Um, and I suppose, you know, if you're, if you're talking about things being commercialized and all, that's a far cry from what happened to you when you were put up on the, 
on the jumbotron yeah. and it makes you wonder um what do people see when they see that these days because um you know do they really have tremendous respect for the young men and women that are going into the service these days and does put it that the question that i have is does doing that does putting them up there does that actually give young people looking at the service the idea that uh well maybe i ought to consider this because we've got some damn good people there or is it just kind of a, a gloss over everything and that's what bothers me as I much mean, as me. to that point okay so i was actually having the same conversation with a friend of mine yeah and he was asking me what's wrong with the military appreciation appreciation day it's a win-win you know they put them up on the big screen it's i he's like i love standing up and applauding for the military i've never been in it i, I love doing that and i said but what's the win for the military? What's the win for us in this game? If we're supposed to be equal partners in this, what's the win for us? Because I don't know that it leads to X number of enlistments or people who are going to sign up. I don't think it leads to many, to be honest with you. I think it just keeps yeah. us. It's one of those campaigns that keeps you fresh of mind, right? Just remember that we're here. It's not targeted like, you know, hey, here's a sale on refrigerators. Go show up to the store and go buy a refrigerator. It's not that. Um, and so from that standpoint, I don't think we benefit from it at all. It doesn't get us more money in our defense coffers. It doesn't make us more lethal. It doesn't get us better at our mission of fighting and winning America, America's wars. It doesn't do any of those things for us. The benefit is all on the other side of the table. They get the benefit from it because they get fans. They get goodwill. They get people to stand up and applaud. They think the organization is great. They think that there is a, a certain amount of um, uh, connection that they have to the military when they don't really have anything. And it's just a, it's a parasitic relationship. Again, I, I could I don't want to ever I, I could go on for hours <laughs> about this because and it's not what we are here to talk about. But uh, I, I was curious about your thoughts um, about how, how vets are treated, um, because I, I think it's important that we sort of rekindle, as you said, rekindle our appreciation for the Vietnam veterans and what they have done. And, and if that is something that we can do, the thank you for your service spiel, if that in, now is starting to pull Vietnam veterans to a place where as they are in the later generation of their life can feel good about what they did. Not that they ever would feel bad about their service per se, but, you know, feel good about the way they are perceived by America because of the way they were spat on and treated when they got home. Then I think that, that for me, that, that I'll take that along with everything else that comes with it. Yeah, I do. I do think that's important. I think you make a very good point there. Um, I would still circle back to the idea, though, uh, and on the commercialization part, that um, there, there's a third group that uh, gets a benefit of that, and that is the group that, uh, like your friend, gets to stand up and applaud and feel good about praising uh, those of us who have served, no matter when it was. But what I'm skeptical about is, is that just an easy way out for people that uh, that will never ever, you know, have have one of their own kids or a or a relative in the in the tough spots, and um, uh, yeah, you know, I'm not sure what the real answer to that is. But when somebody says thank you for your service to me, I say thank you, and uh, uh, you know, it was my my privilege. Um, but I kind of wonder what they're really trying, what they're thinking about when they say that, you know, it's. Uh... I tell my friend, I said, I do. So you don't have to leave it at that. You know, yeah. many are called, few are chosen, so to, so to speak, or whatever, you know, uh, whatever the phrase is, but uh, nonetheless, I, uh, uh, I, I just, I do the same thing. I just say thank you and, and smile and, and yeah. I try not to think too much about it, even though if it is superficial or, or anything else, um, you know, it, it, from that standpoint, for me, it has no personal effect. Um, but as I pontificated a moment ago in the big picture, I think there's a, a whole bunch of other things that go on there. So um, let's get back to the book for just another moment real quick as we we diverted. But um, the reaction you talked about with it uh, and, and when you see more and more veterans today connecting to it, um, does it validate the fact that you wrote it? I mean, is there sort of a... a uh, justification in that sense? Yeah. And uh, two things have happened in the last month, which isn't not directly related to veterans, but I think it it is a little bit of a validation in a different way is that uh, about 
three weeks ago, maybe four now, it won uh, the William E. Colby Award as the uh, solo book in 2020 that uh, uh, was particularly instructive on military history. So I think the fact that it's a novel and won that, um, you know, says something about the way it's resonating with some people. And then two weeks ago, it won the uh, W.Y. Boyd Award, which is given by the American Library Association for the Best Military Fiction, wow. written uh, in 2020. And uh, careful, you don't get hit by me, you know, throwing out my elbow, patting myself on the back here. I don't mean it like that. But what I'm saying is that it's been gratifying to have um, the book recognized in a way that people both in the military and veterans and communities that are interested in that sort of story and literature and knowledge um, recognize as being something worthwhile. So again, that, that's not because I'm a great guy, but because, uh, you know, they, the story that is told in the book is beginning to really resonate with people. Is there anything is the important thing? Right. Is there anything that still keeps you up at night? Is there anything that's still any particular moment that still sort of, you know, uh, brings you back to Vietnam, so to speak? Um, you know, I, I still it, it, it's interesting having written the book. I actually, uh, you know, people ask me if it was cathartic and uh, I say, well, maybe a couple of decades ago when I first started scribbling notes and stuff like that, that might have been. But uh, writing it brought back some memories of some uh, some very difficult times. And um, uh, so rather than being cathartic, I think that those uh, I don't wake up in the middle of the night thinking about any of this stuff. But, um, you know, there are things that happen to you that I think for the rest of your life, you're just you're, you're not going to forget. It doesn't mean that you have psychological flashbacks or anything like that. But I can remember very specific days and events um, that I hadn't thought about in a very long time. Um, and uh, that's not not necessarily a negative, but it's something that I have to deal with. Do you, still, do you still keep in touch with a lot of the guys from your unit who are still around? Uh, less from the unit and more from uh, all of the lieutenants that I went over with. Right. You mentioned um, that. because of the way that we kind of got split up and uh, then, you know, came back together later on. Uh, yeah. What's it like talking to those guys? Is it always a good time to sort of fall back and fall back into the old routine? You know, it generally is. Uh, yes. I mean, we can pick up conversations that it's almost like, uh, you know, 50 some years hadn't passed, which is an amazing thing to say in itself. Um, uh, and most of the stories are, you know, we, we tend to tell more of the funny stories than we do the tough ones. Um, but then uh, when you're sitting in the bar at one of these reunions and uh, somebody gets a few drinks in them and somebody says something that triggers uh, a memory of a particularly tough time, then that may come tumbling out. And it's interesting. This actually happened to me just a few weeks ago. I uh, um, was sitting there talking with four guys I had known in the Marine Corps and one guy just started wanting to talk about one of the toughest days he ever had. And it was the kind of thing that um, you could only do with other vets because other people wouldn't understand what he was talking about. They're at least not the depth of it. And um, while it was kind of tough to sit there and listen to him talk about it, it was also, uh, you know, it was kind of affirming to think that he felt like with that group of us, he could actually do it 50 years after the event. Yeah. <laughs> It's it's such a double edged sword because we we are always told to talk about it, right? We're always told to, yeah. you know, at least veterans of my generation, you know, it's always hey, talk to somebody, talk to somebody, and we, and we encourage it from one another. But still, even even at that, it's hard to be in that space where you feel comfortable being that vulnerable, where you can let all of those emotions out and say the things that are truly on your mind that are unfiltered, uh, and and know that they're going to be met with you know, and received with, with a certain amount of understanding that doesn't require you to go through lengthy detail, 
you know, um, and I think that's so important because it, it's always nice. It's almost like, you know, part of the reason, theoretically, that people are in love with their spouse is that they kind of can complete their sentences for them and they know what they're going to say without having to say a lot. They can just look at them and tell where they are mentally. It's it's sort of those that that level of comfort that you get from other veterans at times that you just don't find with other people. Um, and, you know, it's I even know personally from to just talking to other service members, you know, like I know they haven't deployed and I know that they don't understand they get a little bit of it, but they don't get all of it. If that makes sense. Yeah. I, I think that the, the word you used earlier is, is exactly hitting the nail on the head when you said it, it's vulnerability. Um, because, you know, when you get into the real personal stuff and the real hard, tough personal memories, uh, sometimes of things that you'd really rather not have to think about, um, but for some reason, they're just going to come out. That's a very, very vulnerable place. And I think people have to have to pick the audience for something like that. Uh, as you say, it really takes somebody that's got a similar background to have a real appreciation for what you're talking about and to allow yourself to be vulnerable. I mean, this guy wouldn't have had this conversation that I had a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, if he didn't know the other four or five of us sitting around the table had all been in combat, had all had days very similar to the one that he had and that he was just caused to talk about for some reason. And um, there's no doubt in my mind he would not have opened up uh, 50 years after the event to people that uh, – he wouldn't have been able to, to people that he didn't think really could appreciate what he was saying without judging him in a very negative way for being able to talk like he did. Again, the book is called a Quiet Cadence. Uh, we're going to link it on our website, hasaground.com. Obviously, you can get it where all books are sold, Amazon, everything else. If you're going to go through Amazon, do use our Amazon promotion on hasaground.com as well. Shameless plug there. Um, but you're also working on a new book, I understand it as well? Yeah, yeah. Um, not sure when I'm when I'm going to get that one finished. As you as you can tell, I'm a I'm a slow writer. Uh, you also yeah. have like 17 other jobs or responsibilities and commitments that you're locked into. So don't sell yourself short. <laughs> a, <laughs> maybe I just can't hold down a position. You know, I just <laughs> just keep spinning from one to the other. It's uh, hard, hard to say. But yeah, I'm uh, I'm beginning to get into the work on another one. Not exactly sure where it's headed yet, but. Uh, um, it will have a uh, a uh, a strong veteran component to it once again, which probably shows you I'm not capable of writing a beach read. Um, no, but you, you write what you know, right? That's always what they tell you. Write what you know. So from that standpoint, you're uh, you're sticking in your wheelhouse. So. Well, look, Mark, again, uh, I certainly appreciate you taking the time out to uh, to, to share your story with us. Uh, and, and again, a quiet cadence really resonating with a whole lot of veterans of my generation. I think that's super important because the more we can uh, talk about those conversations that you meant, to, you talked about a moment ago, and the more we can bring those to the forefront, uh, I think the better off all veterans are going to be. And as you said, uh, there's going to be a whole second wave from folks in the post 9-11 world we're going to deal with this stuff 10, 20 years down the road again. Um, it, it Inevitably, it'll all come to the surface at one point in time or another. Uh, it'll manifest itself in different forms. And, you know, we hope that uh, for, my, for my folks that, you know, it, it doesn't end up in a road where they can't undo anything uh, because that certainly is a problem for uh, for the veterans of this generation. So, again, thank you so much for, for everything, and, and we certainly appreciate you being here. Well, thanks so much for having me on. It's been a privilege. And, uh, Thanks for what you're doing for vets. I think the work that you all are doing uh, uh, are, is really important and it's going to have long lasting effects in a very positive way. We hope so. We never, we, when we started this, we never thought it would be that. Uh, we just wanted to tell really cool stories um, and, and we think we do that, but uh, there are a bunch of other ancillary effects and things that this podcast has done um, that, that really we couldn't have foreseen coming. So we, yeah. humble and, and certainly appreciate those words but that's great uh, mark trainer thank you so much for being part of the hazard ground thanks mark i appreciate it 
All right, that'll do it for this week's episode. Again, don't forget to follow us on all the social media sites, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hazard Ground, at Hazard Ground Podcast. Check us out, KillCliff.com, the KillCliff YouTube channel, and download the KillCliff app as well. All the other places you can help consume this podcast. Leave us an Apple Podcast review. We appreciate you guys joining us, and we'll talk to you next week. You've been listening to Kill Cliff's Hazard Ground Podcast, hosted by Mark Zeno. If you have an interesting story to tell and you'd like to be on the show, send us an email at producer at hazardground.com. And if you like the show, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review on Apple Podcasts. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time.